Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles. I'm Len Edgerly. I will be your host today. Well, I'm actually your host just about every day. Well, actually, there was an episode. This is episode 618, and there was an episode that David Peach did for me from Digital Book World. He was the host of that one episode. I've been the host of all the rest. And I'm coming to you from Ocean Park, Maine, looking out at a pleasant sea in the setting light. Kind of everything sort of shimmers. It's, uh, what is it, about 8 o'clock. I have an interview for you this week with David Pepper, who is a political operative. He's the head of the Ohio Democratic Party, and he's also a serious novelist, and he's written three books now. The latest one came out this week, and I talked to him the day it was released on Tuesday. The title is The Voter File, and it uncovers some uh, pretty fascinating aspects of running a campaign and the vulnerability of it because of all the digital components and uh, so I enjoyed talking to him it, it drew on some of my past political work and uh, but this is safe for all uh, parts of the political spectrum I want you to, to know this is mainly about the book and uh, uh, don't don't be afraid to wade in knowing that the guest is a, a partisan because he's here as an author and, and that's what he'll be talking about I'm also going to talk to you about the Fire HD8 and HD8 Plus tablets. Mine arrived this week, so I can give you my impressions of it. I'm pretty impressed, I'll have to say. And also have some tech tips and some excerpts from a book that I'm reading by Brian Dumain. It's called Basonomics, and I'll be talking to him next week. He's going to be my guest next week, which I'm very excited about because this book is pretty astounding. Let's get started. The product news this week that uh, had my attention, got me kind of excited, was the arrival of a Fire HD 8 Plus. This is the new mid-sized Fire uh, tablet that Amazon announced a while back, and it was available for pure pre-order and it just started shipping this week you know i I wasn't really expecting to fall in love with this thing it's a incremental improvement of amazon's tablet you know if you you think of an ipad amazon makes much cheaper tablets that are high quality but they're designed for reading books consuming media doing simple things an ipad is a very sophisticated device especially the ipad pro that i've been uh, really enjoying the last couple of months but these are very affordable tablets and the fire hd8 sells for $90. It's actually $10 more than the previous version of the HD8. That's with special offers and 32 gigabytes of storage. And then the HD8 Plus, which is the one that I ordered, uh, sells for $110 with 32 gigabytes. It has uh, more RAM. It's got 3 gigabytes of RAM compared to 2 gigabytes of RAM for the $90 model. And more RAM, more speed, a little zippier, I figured, and it it would be worth the $20 to, to buy it. Uh, if you are interested in buying one of these now, they, they look like they're pretty popular, especially the Plus. Uh, when I checked earlier today, it was uh, shipping about uh, June 20, 21st. And I think the Fire HD 8, which is cheaper, was shipping earlier, but now it's extended out. So these things are apparently selling very well. Uh, you can also get a charging dock uh, and a, that comes in a bundle with the HD8. So for an extra $30, instead of paying $110, you can get for $140 uh, a nice dock that the tablet rests in. And what's cool is that it will charge it. You don't have to plug in the cable. You just rest it in this dock, and it serves as a stand. And then at the same time, it's charging it. So if you were going to use the tablet for Zoom or something like that, this, this would be a, a good deal. And you're getting... $10 off because if you buy the dock separately, it's $40. And the dock only works with the Fire HD 8 Plus. What I like about this new tablet is surprisingly the size and the design of it. And what I have, I have the previous HD 8, which came out of a couple of years ago, and it's much uh, skinnier and taller. So if I'm holding it here in portrait mode, it's noticeably taller than the the newer model, and it's uh, also a little 
uh, thinner, the old ones. So, so this one, it comes in a little bit more like a square, and that just seems like right. I, the 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 one that we've had up until now, it feels like it's sort of pulling you over the. It, it's sort of a, a long vertical thing, and this is just more like. Uh, kind of a Kindle size reader. So if you're using it for reading a book, it, it really settles into the hand nicely. And the size of the screen is exactly the same as the HD8 that we're used to is. It's a it's a uh, an eight inch screen, but the the margin around it is differently designed. It, the whole tablet has been completely redesigned and speeded up with a faster processor. When I did a speed test with the old one and the new one next to each other, and I tapped at the same instant to open a book, the the new one was noticeably faster. They're saying it's thirty percent faster. I didn't. Call clock it but it's definitely more responsive zippier when i open up uh, a video watchman i hit the two buttons at the same time and it began playing almost instantly on the new fire hd8 plus uh, so they've done some some work under the hood that makes this uh really a, a an excellent an excellent new new tablet now, one thing that surprised me, and I hadn't seen any coverage of this before I took it out of the box and started using it, is that this new Fire HD 8 uh, has uh, dictation. And in other words, if I'm reading a Kindle book and I want to write a note, and I'm reading it on this Fire HD 8 Plus, uh, and there's the, the keyboard comes up if I tap a passage and, the, and then I'm going to add a note. And you have to, up until now, you've had to type on the screen using this on-screen keyboard. Way back when, there was a Fire tablet called the HDX, and you could dictate to that. And I thought it was great. And when they, I don't know, they were sort of making trade-offs, and all the Fire tablets between that one and this one didn't have this dictation capability. But it, sure enough, there it is, and you can use it when you're uh, typing an email or if you're doing notes uh, anything that you have a keyboard you now will see a little microphone icon and you have the ability to dictate to the tablet for various purposes i i, I did notice that you know, i was adding, entering an email address to do an email the microphone did not appear i guess they were thinking well, it's too tricky to dictate an email address so in that one you had to type it in but i suspect that just about everything else that you use uh, typing for you will now be able to dictate to this new fire uh, hd8 and that's that's i think that's great i think you know Amazon, I'm reading in the Bazonomics book about uh, constantly delighting customers, and customers are uh, difficult to please. They're they're always wanting more, and that's kind of the way I am. You know, great tablet, but boy, I sure wish it had dictation. And somewhere in in all the fire uh, teams, uh, somebody saying, "Yeah, we got to bring back dictation," and they did. So, uh, bravo to them for that. Um, Another nice thing about this new one is it has a USB-C port, and that's what I use in my iPad Pro. A lot of other devices use these kinds of cables, which don't have an up position and a down position, like the Oculus Quest uh, VR headset I have has that sort of a charger, and so does the Nintendo Switch Lite. So I can use those cables to charge this, and uh, I think it's, it's a more convenient cable for, for customers. The the big thing about these is the price, and as an example, my sister, uh, Stephanie, has uh, joined me up here. She's going to be up here at another cottage all summer, and she has grandchildren in New Jersey and in Massachusetts, and so the idea of reading a book to them with Zoom, like Darlene and I have been doing with Jake and Ryan, uh, using kind of the two-tablet method, because for Zoom, we discovered we can be reading a book and flipping the pages or we can be looking at them but we can't do both when you when you do a screen share on zoom unless i'm missing a setting uh you don't get to see the video of the people on the other side and when you're reading to a uh, a four-year-old and a six-year-old it's good to be able to see the video because they might have just wandered off if you're not if the story's not holding their interest so what I'm going to try to do for Steph is to order a couple of these Fire HD 8s for $90. Maybe we'll get the $110 one. And, you know, one iPad mini, which has got the exact same screen size as these, actually it's a tenth of an inch smaller, costs $399. 
And so I can get two of the HD8s, the, the fire tablets for Steph, for $180. And uh, then she will be able to use the system of uh, doing the, the Zoom for her grandchildren and seeing them on video on one of them and then uh, turn the pages of the book on the other. So I, I hope that's going to work out, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I guess if I order a couple of, for her now, they're not going to be here till later in June because they're, they're turning out to be so popular. Uh, so I uh, thought I would be pleased with the update, and it turns out that actually having this device to try out f uh, for a couple of days now, I'm really quite enthusiastic about it. I, I think this is a, a significant update for an important, uh, you know, mid-sized tablet. There's a larger one that's 10 inches in diagonal, and then there's a slightly smaller one that's 7 inches. But I think this is kind of the sweet spot. This is the, the 8 inches, a, a real nice size and a nice complement to my e-ink. Kindles uh, for when I'm reading during the day. Uh, I've got a couple of tech tips for you. The, this first one, I, I, I love it when you send me tech tips or ideas that turn into tech tips. And this one I heard from Dan Campbell. And then also Shimon Schott sent me a Polish uh, article about it on a blog that translated into English world of readers. So I, I briefly saw the Polish and then he sent me a link that had been translated. So in each case, the news here is that the uh, Kindles, three of the Kindles, the Paperwhite 4 and the Oasis 2 and 3, uh, now have an update. It's uh, the, the, the number is 5.12.5. And with that update, there is a setting that's called dark mode. And it used to be available, but you would have to go through about seven taps. It was in the accessibility menu because it was, I guess it was thought to be something that would be important for people that had uh, visual problems reading. But now it appears on kind of a quick menu. The way you get to it is uh, from your home screen on your Kindle, you tap uh, settings and then there's a quick menu that appears and you'll see a setting that's labeled dark mode it, it looks like a circle with half dark and half white and there's a line through it and what this simply does is to reverse the display so that your type instead of being black is white and the page instead of being white is black and you know if you're reading at night that might be an easier setting to uh, there could be lots of different situations where that would simply be a better way to read and now that uh, fairly significant change in the appearance of the pages accessible just in two taps so so that's a that's a good thing now there was a, a bit of a mystery because in uh, the article that uh, Dan sent me the link to uh, which was from e ebooksreader.com there was talk that this latest update also enables us to permanently delete a book from our Kindle uh, whereas up till now we've had to use a browser on a computer or some other device to go to manage your content and devices on the Amazon page, and then that's how you would delete a book. Now, this is like deleting a book. Uh, it's, it's deleted from all your devices, and if you want to read that book again, you have to buy it again. It's just like taking a book out of your library and giving it to Goodwill or something. Uh, and, you know, I, I find myself saying, well, why would I want to do that? The, none of these books take up any space. But after, uh, you know, 11 years uh, of, uh, well, more really at this point, 13 years, uh, I've got hundreds of books and uh, there could be a time when I want to do some spring cleaning and I want to just get rid of some that I know I'm not ever going to want to read. Well, when I tried to do this on my Oasis, which has the latest uh, update, I, I didn't see the setting. You're supposed to be able to hold down a title and then look for permanently delete. And if you find that, there'll be a warning that says this will permanently delete the title from your library and all of your devices. If you wish to read this title again, it will need to be repurchased. Well, I just never saw that. So I think maybe sometimes what happens is uh, I have the update. It came through wirelessly to my Kindle, but the actual putting into place of the capability, maybe that comes later because some people have seen it, you know, in this blog post it was described, but on mine at least it isn't there. It'll be something to watch for and it'll it'll be kind of interesting. Uh, second tip tech tip is a question from Nadine. Uh, she wrote with a quick question. She said, so far I have only been getting all of my audiobooks through overdrive. Is there a way I can get them on the Oasis 2019? 
That's the uh, that's the most recent Oasis, I think. If not, how would I get audiobooks on it other than through Amazon? Well, I uh, forwarded this to David, my contact at Overdrive. It was always good to talk with, and he sent it to his tech people, and they sent back this response. Uh, if you're using a Kindle Fire, Fire HD, or Fire HDX tablet, then you can listen to audiobooks from your library using the Overdrive app. Learn how to get started with the Overdrive app. I'll have a link to that Overdrive app if you're curious about it. Some Kindle e-readers, these are the ones with the e-ink screens, may support MP3 files, which means you might be able to listen to MP3 audiobooks. Unfortunately, neither Overdrive nor Amazon directly supports listening to audiobooks from your library on Kindle e-readers. I hope this helps. Please let me know if your listener has any other questions. And uh, if you have questions about that Overdrive app or about anything, you can send an email to contact support at overdrive dot com. Uh, I, that that doesn't surprise me. I, you know, basically it says that if you're using the Fire tablet, it's easy to get the Overdrive app. Uh, there's one in the Amazon App Store, which doesn't have a ton of apps, but it has an Overdrive app, and so you'd be able to have all the functionality of Overdrive on your uh, tablet, including listening to audiobooks. Time now for the interview. David Pepper earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Yale in 1993 and a Yale Law degree in 1999. He has clerked for a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals and served as a member of the Cincinnati City Council and the Hamilton County, Ohio Board of Commissioners. He ran unsuccessfully for two statewide offices, Ohio Auditor and Attorney General. He was elected chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party in 2015. Now, as you will hear, he added novel writing to his political career with the publication of a political thriller titled The People's House in August of 2016. Reporter Jack Sharp was introduced in that book, and he has re- and he returned in the second book, The Wingman, published in 2018, and now this week in The Voter File, which was released on Tuesday, June 2nd by G.R. Putnam's Sons. That's an imprint of Penguin Random House. I visited with David on Tuesday, pub day as they call it, when his book came out. We visit, we talked by Skype, and I began by asking him uh, who Jack Sharp is and what is he up to in this new novel. So Jack Sharp is a is a reporter that has been kind of bouncing around uh, the last couple of books. He he his start in the number book number one, which is called The People's House. He's a Youngstown Vindicator reporter. Uh, I chose that for a reason. I, I, I worry about the state of mid-sized newspapers, uh, but I also admire them because for many communities, they're the only news you get locally. And Jack Sharp is a mid the challenging career of being a longtime reporter at such a newspaper, and there really is a newspaper called the Youngstown Vindicator, one of the great names of any paper out there. Right. Uh, and, and But by this point, he is sort of, he's down and out in the first book, kind of late in his career, jaded, covered politics far too long, but he discovers this massive scandal. It propels him, it, it lets him write the story he's always wanted to write, but it also makes him famous Second book, he's a national uh, cable news reporter, but 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 for the problem is that that in this sort of real life, that news station really kind of put boundaries on what he could talk about and and sort of hemmed him in, which gets him fired as you start the third book, and he's now even in a worse place in the first book because like normal newspapers today, he's too experienced to get rehired. He costs too much, so he starts at the third book as a freelance writer. For the Youngstown Vindicator, desperate to find any story to, frankly, keep himself going. So that's that's where he starts out, and and um, he's got a lot of experience writing and digging in, which gives him some unique skills. But he's also not in the best place in the world. Uh, and and uh, sadly, I think a lot of journalists right now, a lot are on furlough because of what's happening. I think they will see uh, a lot of their own life and, and the kind of ups and downs he's stuck with. Well, and the big story that he takes on in the third book is it's the title of the book, The Voter File. And this is a fascinating uh, bit of behind the scenes work or tool that, that political operatives use. What is the voter file and what is the problem that, that develops in the, in the book about it? 
So the voter file is uh, you know, obviously the name of this book, but it, it's interesting because the voter file to total political insiders will know what it means right away. But my hope is the people who aren't insiders will first think, what, what is that? It, it sounds not only intriguing, but maybe a little creepy. A, a file on voters? Yeah. Uh, that's what it is. It's, it's, you know, there was some discussion of this after 16 with this company called Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and you, you think about it more often now than you ever did, you know, with Facebook and every once in a while, frankly, too often there are security breaches. Well, this is a database of voters that these days every campaign and our parties have that are always adding information about, you know, Joe Smith lives here, here's his income, here's when he voted. And then it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, Jack Sharp, who's a little bit old school, thinks about campaigns in the old way, himself is surprised as a young uh, voter file manager explains to him, this is all the information we have on every voter. And in the end, what, what, what the important part of this book is, is the voter file is not just a, a static database. It essentially becomes the playbook of every campaign how to win. Here are the voters that we must turn out. Here are the voters that we must persuade. Here are the voters that aren't for us, you know, probably don't want to talk to them much. And so these voter files, in every campaign essentially is over the course of its campaign, honing, fine-tuning, updating that voter file. So in the final months when it's time to go vote, uh, you really have a game plan for every voter. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is how it works these days. It's very different from even 20 years ago. And the part, the point, the, the plot of the book, which is, you know, a risk is, yes, hacking emails is bad. Grabbing someone's polling numbers would be bad. You get your arms around someone's voter file, you just grab the crown jewels of a campaign, and you'll know exactly what their game plan is to win. And if you if you do the wrong things with it, which happens in the book, you know exactly what it would take to beat them as well. Well, I ran for the Wyoming House of Representatives back in 1986, 34 years ago. Would there have been anything like a voter file back 20 or 30 years ago on paper, or does this whole thing even become possible because of the technology? I, so I ran my first race in 2001. Uh, I ran for city council, and even then there wasn't anything close to what there is now. A lot of it em evolved between 2000 2010. It used to be you ran your own campaign. You, you not, it's what Jack Sharp – Jack Sharp's description in the book probably reminds you of what you did. Yep. Of, but because his dad was a state rep, and he thinks he's all – he's like, oh, yeah, I used to do this kind of stuff. I'd knock on a door. I'd say they want a yard sign. That's frankly what I saw when I ran for city council in 2001. So you, you knocked on a door. You made a phone call. You kept the data. But it wasn't part of a much broader database – that collects and builds over time that every candidate over time has access at least to their part of the, the their part of the territory and it was really between 01 and 10 that both parties took what was sort of this micro database and turned it into something much bigger that everyone builds on uh, so yeah it's changed so it's just it's a very it's the most you know what we used to do was the basics of it who's going to vote for you and make a phone call so they turn out now though with digital ads, text messaging, phone calls, you know, cable buys, mail, this the voter file allows for much more individualized targeting of voters with very specific messages and and you know, get out and vote or you all of a sudden know their demographics so well, you know precisely what ad might be the one to be most impactful. So yeah, it's far more rich and far more fine tuned and quick now than it ever was when 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 you know we ran in different times. But my guess is our elections were a lot closer in terms of what you did right. than than it is now versus when even I ran. Well, as it exists now, would the Wyoming Democrats and the Ohio Democrats be accessing the same voter file huge database, or do they kind of uh, generate it locally? That's important. Um, you basically have access to your geography of of the file. And so a state house candidate should only have access to their state house district. Um, a statewide candidate has the whole state. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much you get into these book plots, 
the danger in my book is someone is hacked at the, at the highest level. So they've got it all. Yeah. And so they can bounce in and out of individual state house districts and state senate districts in a way that, that you shouldn't be able to do. And again, they have both sides voter files. So they know everything. And that's sort of that's sort of the ultimate, you know, scary proposition is someone isn't blocked by the wall. So yeah, when you have a member of Congress or State House running, they only have access to their voter file. And then when you, if you're doing it right, and people are if you have a volunteer who has to turn on the voter file, they only have a very limited amount of that district. This is what happens if that system breaks down. Right. Well, your first book has gotten credit for being prescient about uh, Russian interference in the election. How worried are you that this book is going to be looked back on as prescient about uh, this kind of a hack for 2020? I, you know, I, 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 I worry. I mean, I worry about, and, and again, the first book, was me sort of brainstorming, and I worked in Russia years ago, so maybe that I picked a Russian character not because I was trying to predict anything. It was just what I know. What, my thought then was, hey, you know, if someone wanted to cause trouble, here's how they do it. It turns out to have been a, a, a parallel to what happened. And, and this is something that I think, and by the way, parties are working very hard to make sure these voter files are secure. I don't want to give an impression that, that I'm the only guy who thought that they need to do that. In fact, if you read the book closely, the technical part of it was actually the secure. It was actual human beings getting into the places and convincing people that they were legitimate employees that was the problem. Uh, so I don't want to have people think that the Democratic or Republican parties don't work very hard to keep things secure. Sometimes the breakdown, though, and it happens in the book, maybe at the local level, where volunteers are all of a sudden able to access more than they should. But again, there's a lot of security, so I don't, I don't want to over-worry people. This is more of a brainstorm about the worst-case scenario. But it certainly is something that, that, um, that parties and candidates should be very careful, that what, you know, whether it's passwords or access or who gets access, you're paying attention to. And, and I'll, not, not to get into too much, uh, you know, uh, and, and obviously this ties into the national conversation, do, you, do I think that, that – you know, the same people who hacked emails in 16 or wanted polling data would would think to get to this type of information? Of course. And in fact, there were stories about in 16 about attempts to hack into voter data. That's not made up. That actually happened. Now, did they have access to the whole voter file in the way this book gets them? No. But but getting into voter data is frankly, you know, grabbing John Podesta's emails is nothing compared to if you're getting real voter data. And of course, I think that attempts are, are probably being made every day by, you know, people with ill motivation to get into campaign voter data, because that's, you know, just same way people are hacking into corporations voter of uh, customer data. It's, you know, yes, that that's a that's something that everyone should be watching out for. Well, and uh, I don't want to get too much into the plot. I did read the book. It was fascinating. But my wife and I did some door-to-door in New Hampshire and Iowa and Nevada for Pete Buttigieg. And so we, we were following the call list, and it was we had apps and all this. It dawned on me, reading your book, probably every decision as to which house we were going to was somebody using the voter file playbook to how to deploy volunteers like us. But what right. what are some – and so if you can change – the voter file and send someone like my wife and me to the wrong house, uh, right. what, what kind of mischief can, can you do yeah, that I, would be very difficult to detect? Right. And that's the kind of, you know, anyone who's done your work probably is worried by the book. You know, one, just as little examples, one of the biggest complaints from volunteers is I spend most of my time calling phone numbers that don't work. Well, that'd be one easy thing to do. Um, but the other, and the one that I, you know, I, it's, it's sort of a, um, it, it's not something to enjoy, although it's it would be a heck of a scheme, is having people call voters that the modeling shows are actually against them yeah. and encouraging them to show up. <laughs> and they're, in the book that happens, but having knocked on doors, you are when you're knocking on doors, you are knocking on doors precisely targeted to get people who Pete booted judge or whoever thought was for them. So, yeah, if someone got into that file and the volunteers were getting – doors of the opposite view or or a moderate who doesn't want to hear a hyperpartisan message 
yeah, you could create a lot of damage. And so that was sort of the, the troublemaking side of me got into those types of scenarios. And so, yeah, someone who's doing what you were, you were doing will understand just how much trouble someone could cause if they did what the book does. Yeah. Well, now you're chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party. I got to imagine that's a pretty challenging job, especially this year. And you're a serious novelist. But how are you dividing your time between those those two activities? So the, the bottom line is, as is, is you know, the publishing business takes some time. Uh, I I wrote this, uh, finished it right around a year ago, and so uh, you know, right now I'm all in working on on Ohio and, and making sure that that we we win our election here. Uh, so I would say that the way I balance it is, uh, you know, I don't play golf on the weekends. I don't like I, I've decided not too long ago not to watch a lot of TV at night. And so rather than doing that kind of stuff, I'll write a chapter. I certainly don't. You know, my day job is my day job. And, and I think the day job clearly informs a lot of what I talk about. But but, you know, I and I also have two young kids. So when there's one is napping, I go and write a half a chapter, or edit something. Uh, and I've been able to do that. You know, it, it probably means I'm not churning out the kind of books that other people do on a, you know, three or six month basis. But it, you can grab it. And it's in the end, you know, ideally, it's not how you're writing a book, but I'm able to squeeze in a chapter or two in between a lot of the challenges and opportunities of my day job. Yeah, but but right now, except for moments like this, where it's launching, I mean, you know, I'm spending almost every second on the politics of, of trying to win Ohio. Yeah, sure. Well, it's obvious how your political work informs the novel because it's a lot of sort of inside information to it. I'm curious when you're doing your political work and you're trying to pursue a partisan agenda, do you sense times when all the work you've done as a novelist makes you better at reading the public or making decisions on behalf of candidates? That is a great question. And absolutely it is, it is um, here. I'll just put it this way. I will have meetings, uh, book clubs, where most of the book club is Republican. And I walk in there as the Democratic chair, and I have a wonderful conversation. Hmm. Why? Because we both entered the book club with a book as the topic and not our partisan affiliation. Wow. And I purposely, if you, know, you read the book, obviously we know what my job is. My main character is a moderate Republican who's kind of down about both sides and doesn't like where the party's turned. He thinks gerrymandering's made it terrible. So I'm purposely nonpartisan in my book. I want, and, you know, I'm, my number one goal, write a good story. But, but close with that is talk about issues in a way that is not turning people off about deep issues that are a problem in our country that everyone can agree on, gerrymandering, dark money. Some of the issues in the third book about monopolies and, and how much they control too much of our economy. Um, and I do that in the book. And in my book clubs, the experience is it, it works. Like, I'll come in. We'll start out talking about the book and Jack Sharp and the characters. And I, I, you won't even know the party affiliation of the folks there. But then we'll start talking about, wow, that dark money, is that real? And I'll say, yes, it is. And too much of it, too much of it is legal. And it dominates or, gerry, you know, gerrymandering. Wow, no one should be able to just get reelected without any competition. Everyone can agree on that. So what's been interesting is the lesson you learn if, if you – even in a, the role that I'm in, which is very partisan, you know, f formally really, even the title. But to be able to walk into a room where they all know I'm this partisan figure, but through the book, it leads to wonderful – literally two or three hours of conversation – that for me is, is as rewarding as anything I do because you're able to talk about all these issues in a way that people are – they're not bringing their partisan you know, gear with them. They're just talking. Um, and, and for sometimes it's also a great way for me to listen. It's almost like a focus group. Um, again, one room you – know, the west side of Cincinnati, for example, is, is you know, known as a conservative place. I had a book club on the west side. I don't think there was one Democrat in that room. We had a great conversation for three hours about all these issues. When I left, they said, why don't you quit your day job and only write books? So they remembered what my job was, but it really – but I think there's a broader lesson here in politics, that these conversations are possible if somehow they start off and they're framed in a way that it isn't about just the, the raw partisanship that so dominates right now. 
Well, and I would think uh, you're you're probably in your 40s or so. If if these books start, uh, uh, I mean, they are successful already. But you've got a new publisher, uh, Penguin Random House Imprint. Uh, can you imagine just shifting your mission of improving the political health of the of the country, the democracy, to becoming uh, a novelist with this mission as opposed to one more guy flailing away in the partisan wars? I don't know. I mean, that in some ways as a writer, I, 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 you, you're jealous of the people who actually can do it only full time. You'll write you, in the end that leads to a much better product. And it's the, the way I write, you know, 10 to 11 at night, wake up more. That's no way to write a novel, <laughs> but that's what I'm stuck with. At the same time, I think that my day job really gives me that very f- frontline perspective that that hopefully makes these authentic and feel real. I want these books to feel absolutely real. As someone who consumes both fiction but also, you know, s- the shows on TV, Scandal and House of Cards, for someone like me and probably you who see, who knows the inside a little bit, most of them are just off the charts unrealistic. And part of my goal, I, I never wanted to predict anything with my first book. I think one reason it did actually predict some of what happened was because it was an attempt to be incredibly realistic about what might happen and what someone who wanted to cause trouble might attempt to do and that actually might work. So I think that the day job and, frankly, my past campaigns and work actually makes the books maybe more authentic than if I were just sort of on the side watching as an observer. Um, so the process of writing might be better, but the material that I'm able to come up with uh, I think is is probably you know helped by 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 the what I see and do every day. It reminds me a lot of David Ignatius at the Washington Post because for years he's straddled his role as a uh, in an international affairs columnist and a novelist who writes about you know international stories, right. and uh, I think he had that same sense that if he were to give up one or the other, he would lose some kind of synergy that he has by straddling both worlds. Yeah, and and he, but and it also you know the good thing on the novelist side is you are you're always looking out for things because you, you know I'll be in a restaurant and someone's serving and I look at their name tag and think. That's a perfect name. So that's a small case. But, but other things, too, like, you know, th- th- my second book starts off at a presidential debate in New Hampshire. I, th- uh, the plot of the book came to me as I watched a 2016 primary debate. You remember when um, Chris Christie went after Marco Rubio? Yeah. And it was this bizarre, and Rubio started repeating himself. I was sitting in my basement waiting for edits on the first book and thought, I've got my book. Mm. The third, the, the new book I've written, which is after the one you've read, the voter file, same kind of thing. And so a lot of the the, the plot minds, the plot lines come to mind from um, from the job. Often, one other thing I'd say, by the way, about what have I learned, and this is a great lesson about book writing. You know, as one author who I, who's well known told me after my first attempt at the first book, David, it's all plot, no character. And obviously he was right. I had to rewrite the book to really get a jack sharp. You know, that's that's a campaign right there. Too many candidates are talking about their hmm. issues. But just like you will never read a plot without a character you believe in, I don't care what you're running for. If that candidate isn't themselves the heart of the story and who they are and their character, uh, I don't care. You know, they could be running for the smallest office and people will go to bat for them if they believe in them. They could be running for the highest office, but if the heart of their campaign isn't their character, they won't. No one will get excited. And so that part of writing books, I use in training of candidates in this day job. Hmm. If it's not about you and what you're about, no one cares. And if it, if it is and it's compelling, you might get people more excited about an office they never before cared about. That's the other. That's another big lesson uh, that, that crosses over both both areas. What can you tell us about your fourth book, when it's coming and what it's about? Well, I, I, I don't know when it's coming. It's, uh, it's a book that, it, you know, my first couple of books have all gotten into um, the, the, the elections themselves. This is slightly different. Uh, it's, it gets into a lot of things, um, and I'm finalizing the draft now. But it's, it gets into sort of a whole different area around, you know, the Senate, Mm-hmm. And the workings of the Senate, 
and Jack finds a he, he stumbles across another major scandal uh, that involves actually a whole different area around um, what are the, the um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term CRISPR, which is this new genetic way that they're finding to oh, battle right. cancer. Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of a whole different area. I, I thought I need to broaden what he's getting himself into. He, you can only hack elections so many different ways. <laughs> I've covered that pretty well. So I'm trying to get into some other things to get into. Again, deep issues in politics, things that'll 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 challenge people around ethics and, and morality and, and other things. Uh, but it, I think it's going to turn out to be a very good story. And one of the things uh, I like about it is I think I'm you know I'm I'm learning as I go. I'm learning as a writer. And I really, I think, in, in the third and the fourth book, Voter File and in, in the next book, I really take more time to really delve into interesting characters, which is fun to do as a writer, but also very important to do for readers. The other thing you've said about these books is that they each start out as a thought experiment. You, you, you take dark money or something and you say, well, now what, how might that translate into a story? Yeah. And th it seems like uh, that's another benefit you're getting in your political job because if you've got something kind of noodling you and you keep hearing about some new idea, you don't just have to read about it. You could go home and start writing a novel about it and do a deep dive into an entirely new uh, truth that, that might be affecting the next five or ten years of your career. And that's how this started. I ran for an office in Ohio, state auditor, that that plays a role in the drawing of congressional lines. Uh. And I spent a campaign in 2010 talking about that, and no one knew anything about gerrymandering. Hmm. Nothing. Democrats didn't. Republicans, some of them did. That was the problem. And they knew about it. They planned for it. And I literally, by the end, was like, no one knows anything about this, and maybe I can explain it better through a novel than I can through some nonfiction that only the, the choir is going to over I'll be preaching to the choir. Yeah. And I knew I had succeeded in this like, to some degree when to, my two siblings, who aren't that political, read my books because they're my siblings and said, boy, that gerrymander is really <laughs> bad, isn't it? I said, yes, I'm so glad you found out that through my book. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm often deciding. And again, the lesson I learned, though, if I don't tell it through a story that's a page turner and I'm just ranting about some issue I care about, no one's going to read it. Right. And the first book was a lesson in how to clean up a story. It's got to be a good story first. And the, and the deeper theme has to be subtle and thoughtful and not look like I'm ranting. And, and I think I've done better in, in that each of the books I've written, including The Voter File, which gets into gerrymandering some. But yeah, I mean these these are sort of thought experiments, a deeper a deeper theme in mind. And and unlike some authors who outline everything, the truth is when I start my books, I don't know exactly where they're going to wind up. I literally spend the entire process stewing about how do I get to an ending that is sort of satisfying but not perfect because the world isn't perfect that we now we live in. So reader a lot of times my books by the end, I feel that again, those book clubs are a great place to hear this. They like the book, but they also – people really want to think about the ending and how I got there and is it perfect. And the answer normally is, no, it's probably not perfect. But that's – a perfect ending wouldn't be realistic. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting process, and I find that my best thinking comes as I write the book itself and trying to figure out with all the characters and all these themes, how would they naturally wrap it up? That's, that's interesting. <laughs> I have been speaking with David Pepper, author of The Voter File, the third of his Jack Sharp political thrillers published today by G.P. Putnam's Sons, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Thanks very much, David. Thanks so much. Great talking to you. It's been a while since I've had anything in the content section, but I've got a good one this week, and that is the book by Brian Dumaine. The title is Bazonomics, How Amazon is Changing Our Lives and What the World's Best Companies Are Learning From It. This is a big book. I'm only 20% through it. I've got to have it finished by Wednesday when I talk with Brian about it. And I, I think anybody that's followed this podcast is going to find a sensibility toward Amazon and Bezos, which is very similar to, to mine. Uh, he, he is not afraid to talk about problems that the company faces in regulation and in treating workers. Uh, but his, his take on the strategy of Bezos and what he's doing 
in the company, I find highly original and just kind of exciting to, to follow. Uh, I'm going to give you a taste of it. Just uh, I've, I, I seem to be highlighting about every other sentence in this book so far, but I'll just share some of uh, the ones that I've got. Bezos is one in a billion, a leader who stands apart from other business titans because he figured out how to use his high IQ, combative style, and boundless energy to build a culture at Amazon that really does care about the customer. I came to this conclusion. Amazon wants to be the smartest company the world has ever seen. Uh, he has created the next generation corporation, the 21st century model for how the world will do business. Uh, interesting uh, facts uh, it's well reported uh, you know he's a uh, uh, been working at fortune for 30 years so there's things that i didn't know about when i uh, am reading that uh, he, he has a, a portrait of jeff bezos on kind of the personal level which also has a fresh take on it uh, but the main thing is is building uh, taking the ai part of Amazon's flywheel strategy. And the flywheel is, you know, you, you have great prices, you have great quality, people come, they buy, and then more people want to sell on your, uh, and you just go round and round, uh, building this virtuous cycle and now ai has been added to it so part of what's pushing this wheel that's been going for 20 years is artificial intelligence you know understanding what we want what we're about to order so that they can tell the warehouse to have it ready to ship to us in you know less than a day uh, uh, and you you really get a chance to see the power of this thing as it has emerged uh, so far. And the promise of the book is that you're going to understand how Amazon is affecting your life as a consumer, but also how the, the business model that's embedded here uh, is likely to just change business worldwide. He pretty clearly had uh, good access. He talks about just wandering around the campus there in Seattle. He interviewed Jeff Wilkie, who I think most people see as the number two to Bezos. Uh, it looks, I'm not sure yet if he's uh, interviewed Jeff himself, uh, but he uh, spent some time on it and uh, I just find it fascinating. I, I, I just kind of stumbled on this book without knowing it was coming. And I, every minute I have, I'm not just to, to get ready in time for the interview, but I, I just, I just love reading it. It's, it's a great read. Now, sometimes I'm aware in the past that I, I can fall in love with a book in the early going. And sometimes I said, Oh, this book is so great. You got to read it. I've, I've read 5% of it and I love it. Well, I read 20% of this, so I'm a little further in. But uh, I, I, I suppose I should have a hold out a caveat there that maybe the second half of the book is really going to disappoint me, and uh, who knows? But I don't think so. You, you can kind of tell how someone is approaching their subject and the the quality of the writing, uh, certainly by this many pages. And I've got a lot more to go, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, before I sign off, I want to share a an email that came in from David Peach. He's the other person who's hosted the show. David wrote, if I were caught up in my podcast listening, you would hear from me more often. I just heard yesterday's episode this evening. That's got to be a record for me. In response to Nadine from North Carolina's comment about color e-ink not being necessary for real readers, I have to disagree. I'm a nonfiction reader who likes to see maps and pictures. I rarely read fiction. Many times there are color illustrations or pictures in the technical books I read, electronics and technology. I much prefer the reading experience on the e-ink Kindle, but end up reading paper or on my tablet, at which point I read on the Google Books app when reading books with lots of illustrations. I realize the vibrancy of the colors on color e-ink may not be as stunning, but being able to see which is the red wire or the green wire would be clear enough. I, for one, would welcome a color e-ink device, and I think I'm a real reader. <laughs> well, well said, and I, I think that that's a good case for why this color e-ink may actually, you know, be of benefit to lots of readers, like like uh, David is saying here. Uh, and uh, that, that I think that's why I kind of kept kept my mind open as I was saying I didn't personally feel a big need for it because I switched back and forth between tablets and the e-ink but uh, if it comes and if it comes at a good price and it's well uh, implemented by Amazon which I'm sure it would be if they use it uh, it it this is a good case for it it will be uh, an advance and uh, and I think everybody here is a real reader so there's there's no questioning about about that aspect of it uh, 
if you haven't had a chance to check out my flash briefing for Alexa, I invite you to do so. It's uh, real easy. You just uh, tell your device, Alexa, enable morning journal, and then you say, uh, Alexa, what's new? And I, I usually put it up by 7 a.m. Eastern time. They're uh, five minutes or less. And thoughts, the things I've read, things I've experienced. Uh, it's kind of a work in process, but I'm really enjoying it. And uh, some of the feedback I'm getting from those of you who are listening to it have been really uh, remarkable and wonderful. So uh, it's a it's a small audience at this point, friends, family, and some listeners from the Kindle Chronicles. And uh, if you'd like to try it out, uh, it, it's pretty easy to do so on, on any of your Alexa devices. This is Len Edgerly looking at the moon, which has popped up over the ocean, casting a a golden path uh, toward the horizon. And uh, you can hear the waves through the window on a a nicely warm 70-degree night. Thanks for listening. Bye.